Thank you for being here uh, at this panel session uh, presented by Carla Brunet, Clara Boch, Diego Diaz, and Susanna Camera in, in remote. And the panel is Art and Possible relation in Relations in Nature and brings three different projects to discuss possible relation of art in, in nature. We plan to pre they plan to present think over and bring about questions on how artists are dealing with climate change issues and how we can create new possibilities of living in balance with nature. Our project of sensing the sea, of creating narrative of a salty lagoon and rethinking ecologies and hopes are introduced of as a starting point of discussion. Uh, here we have Carla Brunet, that is an, she's an artist, a researcher and a professor uh, a, a H A uh, C U F B A <laughs> University in Salvador, Brazil. Clara Bosch, Boch, she's an artist, researcher, and a professor at Politecnica de Valencia in Spain. And Diego Diaz, also an artist and a researcher, and professor at Universitat Jaume I in Castillo de la Plana, Spain. Susana Camera Laret is an artist and independent researcher. Uh, I uh, hope you're, you're going to enjoy this panel and I leave the stage to this fantastic panelist. Hello, uh, just to test. <laughs> uh, thank you everybody for being here and thank you for the organization for having us here and be able to show a little bit of our work. This, this panel is the idea to discuss how artists are working with nature and how they are dealing with this kind of the possible relationships we have with nature. And we're gonna be presenting three different projects and with three different points of view of these kind of relations. So the, the questions that we started as an introduction, how we're gonna do is, how do we interact with nature? How do we see ourselves as part of this nature? Or how can we create possible forms of seeing we as part of the nature? Because sometimes we think, but then we don't, we don't interact with. And is art able to sensibilize about climate change issues and this, these kind of questions? So my, uh, what I brought here is some uh, artists that work with the sea because it's and also my own practice working with different kind of oceans and seas around the world. And this uh, from 2021 to 2030 is the ocean decade for the United Nations. And so it's even more, uh, lately there is even more, at, more attention to this kind of projects dealing with the ocean uh, because we even have the decade. Uh, I started working with, uh, the idea is to bring art and science uh, to show a little bit how we do. And I started to working with scientists. Uh, one of the things that made me do was like reading uh, a book about uh, environmental aesthetics and uh, from Alan Carson. And he says that the scientists can have a better environmental aesthetics than the artists, that the artists can be better judging art than the environment. And then I got a little like, oh, come on. And then I said, okay, I'm gonna get together with the scientists to understand uh, the environment better because I've been working for so long with the environment and I work a lot of the oceans around where I live. So one of this idea of dealing with this relationship with nature is thinking of art, science, and the sea. And so there are some artists, I, I brought here two projects that inspires me, like from other artists. It's Noise Aquarium by Victoria Vesna, that you guys might know. He, and, and she was using the, the, working with plankton, and also the idea of the noise in the ocean, the noise for whales and dolphins, and how this more and more, because Jacques Cousteau said the, word, the ocean is a silent word, but we know nowadays it's not silent anymore. And she was working with these planktons and make them very big. So you, have, you start thinking that they're kind of whales, the plankton, you have another dimension and you kind of are part of it in the installation. And also I brought here a uh, work by Robertina Sebianchi and Juno Sutch. 
And it's also, you have a work of her also in the exhibition here from the, from Isaiah. And she's also working with the pollutants in the water and also to working together with scientists and trying to see how they interact and how they, how together they come with different ways of seeing this sea and also bringing attention to this kind of projects. And also the process is important as well as the, the final piece. Here are some of the installations, some photos of the installations that you could hear the sound and see. And I got a little bit, uh, I got a little bit of the, some past works that I've done. For me, all the, the work that I do in try to get this relationship with nature, they always have to do with location base. It's really important with the location where I am and think that location and how it is. So I just got two works that we've done in the past. One was interactive installation that we were dealing, we called geographies of the sea islands with the islands around where I live. And we are working together with the oceanography department of the university. And we're getting their data and doing visualizations with their data. And also uh, images of the, these islands around. And we created a map on that. And the other one was working with sensors and Arduinos and we did our own science, like citizen science where we collect this information and would go around the town, go around the city, and then we went in a boat in the bay and then up the river. Also, not, not only, and then we did a exhibition on data visualization and all this process also. The process was also really important and also the, the talk we had with people in the streets. So here's just two prints of these two projects. Two different, this is, part of the exhibition, just the, the card. We had this card where we had the Arduino and the images in, uh, you have the, the uh, real time data in a tablet and we, we would go around the city and go in the ocean with, it, with the sea and also the river. So the, the last works that I've done, that I've been doing, one, I got here two works for you. And one is the work uh, that I've done in Antarctica with scientists because I've been collaborating with them since 2010 with the oceanography department, with the chemists, the physicists of the oceanography department. And uh, nowadays I'm working also with the, chemi the chemistries also. And this project and also biologists were all related to the oceanography. And they invited me two years ago to go Nine, two, three years ago, in 2019 to 20, the, this summer, to go to Antarctica with them. And then after us, uh, we got almost six days there. And then I had to, uh, I, I created some artworks based on the experience with them. One was about walking because I had already a project on walking. And when I was there, it was the hottest summer in Antarctica. And also it was that year that they found out some moss that was frozen for 1,500 years came to life in England. So I did a, a video narrative on that and I painted frame by frame of the video by hand and go telling the story. A dream. The only place on earth where no country is sovereign. Where no one can economically explore the place. Where mining is prohibited. Here, everything is research. Everything is environment. The video continues, but it's just to have a little bit the idea and then I go narrating the things and then the talks that I had, things that came to my mind about the talks that I had with the scientists. And then another project that I did there was a uh, performance with where I mix the scientific 
work, whereas documenting them to do the work, and I was in the lab with them, I was helping when there was an, a lot of rush, and mixing with my insights and also some data visualization of their, their, uh, their, the data that they collected. And also there is, uh, because we are in Antarctica, and they, they always said that everything in Antarctica is about tempo. Tempo, the word in, in Portuguese is time, but it's also weather. And it's like when the weather forecast is good, you can do that or not. And when the captain of the boat says you can do it. So your time related to these two controls, the forecast and the military, because I was in the boat by the military, Brazilian military. So I did some control photos. That was the people that were controlling my time there. And also these forecasts. And then I did a little bit of this mixing with the sounds and I create sounds out of the images. And I'm gonna put just a little bit here, just to have an idea. This is a performance I did in Portugal last year. It's just some of the recordings that they had that I could have from the performance just to have a little bit of a clip. And then my latest work is that I've done, I was uh, last year for some months in the Polytechnic University of Valencia in La Boluz. Uh, doing a, as an invited researcher and I was working a lot of the Mediterranean Sea because I've been working with the sea around where I live, I've been working the sea in Antarctica in the Southern Ocean and then I, I went to specific points of the Mediterranean and the idea was to have my body as a sensor also sensing the data of the place and also having narratives and searching for these different narratives of the places. So here is like I use some portable sensors to collect uh, salinity, pH, and conductivity of the water. And I went diving. I went. I was rowing. I was paddling. I was doing everything to be in the ocean and to feel the ocean. Swimming. Here is the points that I went to collect the data. Because. And then every walk, every day I would walk like 10, 20 kilometers and also I did the track of everywhere I've been to. Every day I was recording where I've been to create these maps. And also I tried to make the whole, uh, the beginning until the end like a drift, in starting with Celta and Gibraltar. And then I talked to fishermen, uh, environmental police, different places. And then I did a, a performance in the beginning here in the first day of the ISEA where I mix all this information and create a sound. And also this like, I was in every place I was looking for a lighthouse because lighthouse was kind of the anti-sea, like what's not the sea. And in these walks for the light, another day I was walking and collecting sound with a hydrophone, like recording the sound of the water. And this guy stopped to talk to me and then he had lived in the, in the lighthouse that I was working the day before. So I was interviewing people and getting these narratives about how it was to live in a lighthouse. Until he was seven years old, he lived there. And also I was, collect, I was getting uh, information on the ocean and also then later I worked with a scientist in front of my university. And this, this is a molecular of the Poseidonia Oceanica that's everywhere in here and also the balls. And then I, because this scientist that did the, that with me, the molecular for me, she works with microplastic with the Antarctica and these balls of the Poseidonia are, are known for also collecting the microplastic of the, out of the sea. So it was, we started discussing on that and about the immigrants, the refugees, so was a mix of everything. And I'm also working nowadays with the coral reefs in my area and we're about the oil speed, but it's a beginning of a project that I work with the people from the chemistry and biology department. And I'm almost running out of time, so thank you very much. And this is my website and my research group website also.
Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm really happy to see all of you. Thank you for staying here, listening to us. It's an honor to have this great audience. Uh, I would like to present myself. I'm Diego Diaz. I'm working together with my wife or partner, Clara Boch, <laughs> since the year 2000. Um, we are artists and professors at different universities in Spain. And we have been working in the field of new media, art and technology for since 2000, as I said before. And I would like to present this project that we started in 2012 that we call uh, uh, ISP, Institute of a Study of Biological Enigmas. Uh, this is a fictional, fictional entity, a fictional uh, research uh, laboratory that we create for analyze an area where we have a closer relationship because we are together uh, we are from a south part of spain when we were child we were uh, in this uh, wonderful um, uh, beautiful landscape this is called uh, minor sea or mar menor this is a salty lagoon in the southeast of Spain, in Murcia region. Uh, and uh, as you can see there, uh, there is a little bit of a map of the, of the lagoon. Uh, the lagoon was a paradise, a natural paradise with, with very clean water, very transparent, a lot of fish, a lot of nature living there. And, and because there was a very touristic place, the space start to transform and we start to, to develop this project in the year 2012 where we got the artificial intelligence grant uh, from Telefonica, uh, Telefonica Foundation in Spain in order to develop this project where the project, the idea of the project was to develop an artificial intelligence uh, like a monster, like an entity who lives the idea is to create this uh, entity that lives in the in the in this environment um, and is uh, act, acts and reacts according with the environment's transformation and the environment situation that is happening in the surroundings. We create the ADN of the of the monster and so so called monster. We create this uh, ADN according with the. Uh, dynamic system model models by uh, a full professor from the University of Murcia, Angel Perez Ruzafa, who has been researching for, for more than 30 years in this ecosystem. Uh, he's a biologist, is one of the well-known biologists in the area who is researching about this space, and he created this uh, digital dynamics model uh, trying to represent or to study the whole ecosystem, how the, the whole ecosystem transformed and, modi and modified according with different rules like human nature, human actions, uh, and, the, and the, the species who live in the ecosystem and so on. So basically, the, uh, we, we, what we did is we transformed this, uh, this model into code, into computer codes with different uh, algorithms. And in, with this model, uh, we create this artificial intelligent entity um, who live in this ecosystem. And the idea is that people can use an application for mobile phones and, and tablets, as you can see there, and they could go to do sightings, monster sightings in the lagoon. Uh, you can see me there using the app and look, uh, doing the, the, the monsters I see. This is why you can see here as I see perception. Uh, so the idea is that people go there with the, with the application, they, can, they could take photos, and this photo will go directly to our website, as the project website, where there is a database of all these pictures, all these sightings of the monsters. Um, so the idea was somehow collect uh, another way of looking the nature, another ways of understanding the surrounding and the landscape. Uh, a, 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 a landscape that we understand, we understood as a landscape who is lost uh, um, their nature somehow and, uh, and be completely transformed by human activity. 
uh, in the because this uh, this landscape start to transform. Maybe Clara will explain later better. Uh, start to transform in the in the in the year 75 because in 1975 because the because before this nature was totally uh, without human action. And after that, the transformation on the landscape become to, to be affected by the human activity so much. Of course, human has been in this environment forever because there was in the old times Romans and many cultures who have been working and have been using this environment. But in the last times with the, with the uh, evolution of humanity, the transformation has been, has been much powerful. So, this is the project, and now I will pass the, the, the mic to you. Gracias, Diego. Uh, well, hello, everybody. Uh, well, the reason we start with this project that is uh, maybe, uh, no, uh, it has already almost 10 years old, is because this was uh, one of our um, well, interests, personal interests, but uh, because as Diego says, we have an uh, emotional relationship with this landscape. And, uh, but later, uh, we um, decided to create a bigger project and invite uh, other artists to, to work with us, trying to, uh, to research and participate of the conversation of uh, how you know, or to make question around how artists can participate in the, in, in the um, discussion about the future of this environment. Why, uh, I mean, why this discussion? Because in 2016, no, I will show you uh, briefly a short documentary that we have created to explain the changes in, uh, in Mar Menor landscape. Is, uh, I, will, I will just... Uh, a stop in some in some places because the documentary is long. But I uh, invite you later to to do a little bit of of research and later explain you. I will explain you how our project try to to address this situation. Well, as Diego says, Mar Menor is a salty lagoon in the south of Spain. It's a very special lagoon because. Uh, uh, it's not as Venice, for example, where the water are green and uh, with the eutrophication. It's a, it's a very special place because it's shallow waters and transparent water. So, uh, and it has a very uh, specific uh, cultural idiosyncrasy and a very singular ecosystem of flora and uh, fauna. So, uh, it's been um, a very special place for people from Murcia, and also is uh, been in the in the 70s. It started this kind of uh, tourist development, no? and it's been a kind of a very aspirational place, no? a place to to be there with your family in the summer, no? and it's a, it was a place for the production of salt, and it has a very special. Uh, uh, area is called La Manga. is a, a sandbar of 14 kilometers uh, long that uh, it's uh, create a border between the Mediterranean Sea and the uh, Minor Sea. No, this is La Manga. So this is the beginning of the development in the 70s. This is the main uh, promoter of, uh, no, of this. It's a kind of uh, businessman that decided that this is going to be a very touristic resort. This is from the archives of the government at the, the Nodo. No? And I will show you how finally this sandbar now is full of uh, Apartments where you, you, it's really nice because you can have a Mediterranean Sea from one window and the Salty Lagoon from the other window of your, of your house. I don't know how, how many of you are from Spain, but I think in, Sp in Spain is quite well known place. 
and there are very few spaces now that are um, that remains in a natural state. No? It has 14 uh, levels of protection in a regional, national, and international level, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't mean that it has been really protected. No? So I will show you. A little, I will forward a little bit. Mm. This is the manga now, and this is the, the um, land surrounding this area. Is uh, it was traditionally from uh, dry agriculture? I mean, non-water, non-using water, non -water it's agriculture, but. Uh, after this uh, transformation from science since 2000, it became uh, uh, intensive agriculture production area. No, so this uh, means that there is a lot of uh, uh, chemicals going through the, this uh, this land, and these chemicals arrive uh, to the lagoon. No, through the escorrentia, no, when it when it rains, no, all the chemicals go through the through the sea. So in the in the 2016, there was a big problem of eutrophication. It was called the green soup. This uh, really beautiful transparent water landscape it becomes totally green, and the water lost uh, totally the transparency. It also uh, it, it is also a, a place where, uh, how to say, there is a lot of complex system about precarious precariousness and uh, migration workers and stationary workers, and this is the eutrophication uh, process. So in 2016, suddenly everybody is. Uh, um, realize that this landscape was entering in a new state of, of collapse. It was something that the ecologists and, and activists were already uh, saying long time before. And, yeah. and this is fun because it's uh, our uh, politicians. Uh, they were saying, oh, it's no worry, you can still swim. It's not, it's not dangerous for, <laughs> for health. And this was the kind of uh, media solution they were proposing, no? just propaganda. And uh, well, there was, there has been since 2016. There has been a lot of uh, demonstration and uh, citizenship actions to claim for a solution for Mar Menor. A solution that uh, c comes from the um, uh, regulation of the agriculture, no? the creation of a green wall that uh, uh, doesn't allow these chemicals goes to the to the sea, uh, and uh, well, mainly um, regulation that goes or try to uh, address the issue of the water transparency. No. So, and also there has been, uh, I think it's important to, to say, there has been a lot of uh, climate, um, how to say, issues as a flat. So, uh, in 2019, there was a super big uh, floats and uh, it was um, worse for the environment and also there was a lot of uh, episodes of anoxia that means that all the fish of the of the lagoon uh, were uh, going to the land because there were no oxygen in the water so they were uh, going out and they they died so there was like two days of fishes fish uh, um, dying suddenly uh, no? So, 
This is the situation of the Mar Menor. And uh, where is it? Yeah, this is. Well, so from the nice postcard, <laughs> we, we um, well, the landscape transformed into a very complex ecosystem that we understand uh, as a prototype of, uh, of the collapse. No? It's a really critical zone where all the uh, challenge of the contemporary, contemporary societies, uh, climate change, the trophic, no uh, chain changes contamination water contamination precarity preca precariousness uh, well, I mean social uh, conflicts uh, are happening at the same time no so this is why our first uh, artistic interest became a, a wider project where we try to think about uh, no to to join with other researchers in different areas to think about this uh, process. I think it's interesting this kind of images. This one is the Anoxia episode. So uh, since uh, 2016, this has been uh, happening all the time and there is a lot of the government has uh, uh, initiated a lot of different process to, to solve it. And mainly they create a scientific committee is a kind of uh, well the most uh, well-known sci scientists uh, from expert in uh, in lagoons and coastal coastal lagoons they have been there thinking uh, uh, taking data from the sea studying observing trying to solve the situation of the of the transparency of the water of the dead of the and uh, there was also there has been also a social initiative that has led to the um, uh, how to say uh, around one month ago it was proof uh, it was approved in the government of Spain the um, legal rights of the of the lagoon is the first environment in Spain that has officially get uh, uh, legal uh, rights. So, I mean, but the, but the problem is still there. This summer is going to be very complicated and this affects people just uh, in many levels. In, a, uh, in the um, activists are worried about the environment, but uh, real estate agencies are worried about the tourists because they are not going to go this summer because the water is full of dead uh, fishes or is green or whatever, or you cannot sail. There is also worries about the market, the food markets, because uh, people in Europe, uh, no, they don't want to buy veggies from a, no, a place like this. But at the same time, uh, this place continue feeding uh, Europe with the with the um, veggies no, that are being produced massively. So in this context, well, I will go. No. In this context, we decided to, to create a project that we started in 2017. Sorry, the, the slide is in Spanish, but I think it's very easy to understand. We try to, to create a relationship uh, between different knowledge that are being put uh, to work in this area, like uh, the ecology, environmental science, engineering, because uh, there is a lot of solution that comes from the, the uh, engineering that try to, for example, clean the lagoon as a swimming pool, no, with chemicals or this kind of thing. So science are, and engineering are giving a lot of solution also from the economy, the, the laws, no, etc. Uh, and also there is a lot of different agents, uh, the university, the scientific committee, the neighbor, politician, the fishermen, uh, the activists, etc. And there is a no, uh, at the same time, there is a lot of different actions happening there and, um, and uh, yeah, acting uh, on the lagoon. The, 
from propaganda, as we just saw, to uh, citizenship actions as a embrace the lagoon or uh, cleaning the lagoon or research, no? or, or different kind of things. So uh, and at this point we thought, okay, uh, what can arts uh, uh, add, no? or how can artists partic participate in this conversation? Because there was a moment also that artists were very the, implicated in this in this situation, but just as a representation, no? like, uh, okay, let's do a collect for, for the Mar Menor, the, let's, let's sell our artworks. But we thought it was a very uh, poor place for artists to, to be. So we uh, decided to make a project, uh, try to join efforts and uh, bring some question on the table about uh, the whole situation. Not just what kind of solution can we have for the Mar Menor, but what kind of solution can we have in the context of the new challenge, no? How we are gonna continue uh, feeding ourselves, uh, uh, creating an economy, uh, sharing our lives with, uh, no? with the different levels of life we have, no? the relax, the holidays, but also the, the working people that are there. So we try to make this question more uh, complex, not just uh, how we can bring transparency again back to the landscape, but how, why, or for how, what do we want this transparency, you know? So we were uh, funded by Fundación Daniela Nina Carazo through uh, one call, open call, that this uh, name is uh, Componer Saberes, Knowledge Composition, something like this. So we had three years for, to, to think together around, around all of this. This was made on promote by the University of Murcia, these are some of, of the names. Uh, also, now I am working at the Valencia Polytechnic University. And, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> and I will show you some of the action we have, we have been making. Uh, we have been working in a, a critical cartographies so we have been working with uh, neighbor from the from the area and different kind of uh, uh, professionals to understand better the, la the lagoon, uh, doing different kind of uh, maps that show the lagoon in in, a, in different level from the from the personal perspective to the biological and historical perspective to the aspirational perspective. We have been working with scientists, but also with uh, migration workers and illegal workers. So for them, the, the lagoon is a totally different thing than for the family that go there to in, uh, in August. We did some open calls to invite other artists to, to think with us about these issues, to share so, um, I mean, we have created together with a theater company, we have created a, a piece uh, of uh, interactive theater. I mean, uh, for example, we create, I will show you just a little bit, uh, underwater cinema with uh, Christ, uh, Christina Stadbauer uh, researching about the Pina Nobilis which is this kind of shells that lives in the Mediterranean coast and is in danger, is is disappearing totally, but uh, we don't know exactly why in Mar Menor is surviving under very stressing conditions. So she created a project to research about this and we, and we did an underwater cinema where everybody went there and we stayed there <laughs> underwater during five minutes watching a movie that was shown to the to the NACRAS, to the Pina Nobilis, to show them uh, instruction to to survive <laughs> in this planet. I mean, we have tried to address this uh, topic in uh, in very different uh, levels and trying to involve different, very different uh, uh, 
uh, knowledge. Also, because this was a project that tried to change somehow how the university and the academia knowledge uh, works and how the disciplines uh, works, because the problem is much bigger than the solution that any disciplines can offer. So well, I could stay work talking for hours <laughs> about this project, but later on the questions. Yeah. And uh, there is a, another panelist that cannot be to, today with us. It's called Susana uh, Leret, and I will show a video. She um, sent us uh, about the project she is working now that is also founded by the Fundación Carazo grant uh, uh, Componer Saberes. To share some aspects of the work we are currently developing in line with the crossovers between uh, nature, culture and territory that will be discussed in this session. The project Cultivate Cultures, Ecologies of Hops is an ongoing research um, that stems from a polyphonic look at hops situated in the province of León. This is the main territory linked to its cultivation in Spain, responsible for the production of around 95% of all Spanish hops throughout its riverbanks. Spain produces around 809 tons of hops per year. It's uh, the 11th largest producer globally. The project aims to readdress existing relationships with the plant, inspired by its geopolitic and somatic properties, to rethink the ecologies of the plant's image and residues by activating a diverse platform for research and experimentation. Our working team is a collaboration between the plant, the soil, the water, the hops producers themselves, local residents, artists, artisans, ethnobotanists from the herbarium, uh, anthropologists from the University of León, chemists from the Agrarian Technological Institute of Castile and León, and the local councils. The work begun through a personal art project, an art residency in 2018, and as of last year, we were able to take the work further thanks to a two-year fund we received from the Daniel Anina Carazo Foundation, as well as the co-financing from the Autonomous Council of uh, León and the Council of the Town Carrizo de la Ribera. So in this image, you see a map of the spread of hops uh, harvest between its introduction in the 50s and its concentration in León, mainly in the Orbigo Riverbank, where the project is based um, in the 70s. Um, during the 80s, hops was commonly referred to as the green gold due to its economic significance, with a cultivation of around 1,700 hectares. In León, there was a time where it was cultivated throughout all of its riverbanks, as you see in the image, but currently these have been reduced to 550 hectares with the majority concentrated in the Orbigo riverbank. Today, this is a region with an economy largely dependent on the agri-food sector and tourism, undergoing a strong process of deindustrialization. It consists mainly of rural environments, largely affected by the demographic crisis and the loss of population. In 2020, the province lost 5,003 people, 48,000 during this past decade. These numbers are illustrative of the current state of the territory, where around 88 towns have 10 or less inhabitants, 42 have 5 or less, 3 have 2, and almost 7 have only one inhabitant. A scenario that from the onset difficults any attempts to stimulate any long-term thinking initiatives or policies for generational renewal and change. The age of the average hops producer is, for example, around 50 years of age. So time is a key element we are working with within the project. And because of this, we have been documenting aspects related to the plant's memory and iconicity, for example, by interviewing farmers who cultivated the crop in the 50s, as well as its present state, by recording the current cycle of the plant's harvest and associated experiences. So I'd like to, uh, to listen to one of the voices that form its current landscape of harvest um, by playing a small video with a hops harvester called Gabriel from La Milla del Rio in the Orbigo riverbank. Yeah. 
Pues ahora mismo estoy podando, un poco retrasado, pero yo a mí me gusta podar pronto y tarde para que, para que salga más repartido, para, para treparlo mejor. Es cortarle lo seco y que brote otra vez. Este ya está bastante brotado, pero eso no le per repercute en nada. Es podarlo, después cuando salga, o sea, poner las cuerdas y ya treparlo para que suba y que llegue arriba y que quede bastante, claro. <risa> La planta es una planta trepadora que llevamos mucho tiempo viviendo de la zona, en la zona de, del famoso oro verde que le llamaban, pero ahora ya no está el oro verde, ahora ya es otra cosa. Pero es una planta trepadora y, y, y vamos, que a Dios gracias hemos vivido de ella mucha gente en la ribera y, y en muchos sitios, claro. La gente joven ahora no le gusta, no siendo, bueno, pues hay que trabajo manual, claro. Ahora a la gente joven no le gusta mucho doblar la rodilla, no. De hecho, gente joven, bueno, joven, los, los que menos tienen aquí, los más jóvenes, tendrán 45 años. Pero ahora de juventud, para, para trepar y eso, nos vemos y nos deseamos para encontrar gente. Porque, claro, la, la vida del orador... Tiene que gustar mucho para, para tirar para adelante. A veces se, se saca algo y otras veces, pues... Pero está muy complicado para, para, para la agricultura. Y como buenamente decían hace poco, que se puede ir una vez al médico, puedes necesitar una vez un abogado, pero comer se come tres veces al día. Y la tierra es lo que lo produce. Hay buenas variedades de esas nuevas, pero claro, si ahora no quieren dejar poner más, pues no sé qué pasará. De momento, habrá que conformarse con esto. Yo de momento no voy a cambiar ninguna variedad porque igual es el último año que lo trabajo. Va a hacer 67 años este año ya. Así que hay que ir pensando en descansar, que también lo merecemos. Eso es. Este año trabajaré las 9.000 plantas que tengo, casi 10.000, y para el año que viene, ya veré. The idea was to bring a little bit of projects that we've done and then come with a discussion about how we artists collaborate, how we artists collaborate with science and also how we relate to the nature. And one of the things that interests me is what uh, Clara was explaining that the lagoon where they work has the rights and that's something kind of new nowadays, the last uh, decade or a little bit more, because uh, Ecuador was, I think, the first country that had gave rights to a river, and then Bolivia, and then New Zealand, and now this island here, and I think this is an interesting way that we as human beings can relate it to the nature, because if companies have rights, no, the, the companies has a, a number, a right, and they can So why not the nature has right to? So we all are dealing here with water, with the sea water, or with, the, with uh, agriculture also, with the land, the earth. And we have to think, like the guy said in the video, we don't, uh, uh, you go once, you need a lawyer once in a year, but you need to eat every day, and to eat, you need the land. And the earth, you know, that's in there. So I think it's interesting for us to think how we related to that. And I think one of the important things is also to think of this environment that we are part of it also has rights and also has a, and a lot of beings depends on that, not only human beings, but many beings. And so I think that's one of the starting points. And 
for my work that I've done here in the Mediterranean was really important to to fill the sea with my body has the body as a sensor and also when I was talking to the environmental police in Gibraltar I asked them where I can collect water because I was collecting water for salinity pH to check acidification of the sea and everything and he said why are you doing that you can get a spreadsheet with my boss and she has the whole year not only today and I said yeah but a spreadsheet is numbers in a paper or in a screen of the computer and if I go there and I collect the water and I see if the water is cold or hot or what it is and they can feel the salt on me and then I collect how, salt, how salty it is the water it's a different way of being a different way of interacting with nature is more organic than this data gets organic and I can understand better and it can be part of my life and that spreadsheet's not so I think you guys also in the work you did there a lot of artists came also into the and working with you and also if you could say a little bit about this connection of you guys especially like the body connected to there because you were from there no and you were living there and teaching there and so how you connect with that lagoon I think it's more like in a subjective perspective maybe well, it was very important to leave the, the place, I mean, to experience it. So we have been um, uh, organizing for several summer kind of uh, encounter with no, a meeting with uh, artists and students. Uh, and we also invited uh, some scientists that the, the scientists that are in the region thinking about uh, about the, the lagoon so this was a, a really nice experience also we were really much in touch with the fishermen with the neighborhoods no because we were trying to to how to say uh, not to la jerarquías hierarchies hierarchies of knowledge so we were putting during this uh, summer lab we call it mar menor summer lab uh, we were putting all knowledge in the same level so the the traditional cooking of the area to the to the um, biological models of the microbiologists no we were working with the diatoms but we were also uh, working with um, with the people that park the car when there is a lot of tourists, no? And these all levels uh, allow us to, to really understand the, the richness and the complex, no? complexity of the, of the space. And of course, we also experienced some uh, really big storm that almost destroyed our lab because of this uh, climate, <laughs> new climate. Uh, situation so all of this was very very important for for doing the uh, a situated research no and um, to be affected but but the, what is, what is happening there no? so of course and also I think for the artists that were uh, uh, creating their project was very important to to have this relationship with the with the place before we continue, do you, does somebody have any question or can have a comment on something? Yeah. Hello, thank you. Um, I had the chance to go to Ronen Ram, that I think is one of the pieces of your project uh, made by Onirica Mecanica in Madrid. Uh, but I'm curious about the underwater cinema experience. I, I don't get if uh, you watch the film underwater or you record underwater or the film is for these survival creatures. Can you explain a little, please? Well, this is part of the Christina Stahlbauer um, no? Imaginarium. The, uh, she's working around the idea of uh, of uh, agency that uh, creates and help uh, endangered species to survive. 
So she was there learning a lot of uh, about uh, Pina Nobilis, the Nacras, because there is this kind of uh, places where they are surviving. They, there is this uh, uh, aquarium at the university where they are um, growing in, um, in captivity. No, it's one of the the only places in the world that they are uh, having this this uh, situation. So, so she, uh, with all this knowledge, she create a kind of a video explaining what to do and how do how nacra should survive so we created a real cinema underwater with chairs and their chairs were with a with a strong uh, stones no so they, have, they couldn't float and a lot of people were uh, invited to come uh, and we were all with our uh, snarker no, because because the sea is very shallow, uh, the water was maybe one meter and a half. So we were sit there with our snorkel out, and we put a, a screen also, and we in the place where the nacras were, and we watched the movie with them. <laughs> we know the nacras doesn't have eyes, <laughs> and they never watched the, this movie. But it was really interesting experience to put ourselves out of the kind of knowledge we we understand, no, and of, uh, mainly because we get uh, these neighbors, activists, the people from the, the from the aquarium, no, some scientists doing this with us, and it was a really important point of uh, meeting point, no, where where conversation starts, no. Um, even if the situation is <laughs> strange, I know, but this kind of uh, strangeness, I think, is very important to to look to the situation from another perspective. And I'm sorry I cannot show all the projects because there were a lot of artists very interesting doing nice things. But I uh, really invite you to check the website. <laughs> uh, Marmenorlab.org. <laughs> So thank you uh, to present the really nice uh, work that you're working on. I just have uh, a comment about the Noise Aquarium project because um, the image that you credited for Karina Lopez, I did it. So I just wanted to say that. So I work on the Noise Aquarium. I did all the computer animations. So this is, yeah, just a comment. Thank you. Yeah, Jacques Cousteau said that in the 70s, but we know that nowadays is not a silent word. Even the 70s was not, but for him was like the idea of going into the water and getting this different environment. Hi, I mean, my question's about working with scientists and the challenge of being an artist who has to think about the level of fact compared to the level of metaphor and where do you stand along the line? So my question is about um, when you want to basically educate people in your projects, do you, how, where do you decide to draw the line between presenting the facts from science? And where do you start to think about how those facts can be turned into artworks? Uh, well, uh, the thing is that I don't think that the facts of the science are, are the reality. I mean, I don't think there is this uh, limit and boundary. For example, in Mar Menor, we have a scientific committee. They are all 30 year researching uh, the lagoons and they all have different reading of the, da of the data. For them, the data is interpreted differently, and we have a lot of discussion. And some of the scientists have uh, gone. They say, "Okay, this this scientific committee uh, is not reading the data as I think." So there is a big discussion, <laughs> and it's very poli politicized. So what what the citizens in Murcia were expecting from science, that oh, the answer is there. And this is the obje objective, no, and, and real. 
uh, it's not happening because science is also uh, an interpretation process. Of course, there is a, a lot of knowledge, uh, uh, methodologies, no, to to help scientists to extract and knowledge from what they are looking for. But metaphors are also uh, another kind of of uh, a way of creating this knowledge. So we, we try not to not to deal with this dichotomy. Sorry, but I, I, there is a lot of words. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have uh, the word in English. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, the sciences that I work is a little bit different. The connection that I have with what you guys have, maybe what, what as you explain, because I work with them for many years. So we kind of. Uh, and it's since like 2010 and we work together and we sit together and sometimes I give an idea about something that they are doing like oh yeah even even when they come to my part of the university they say oh it's all colorful the walls here in our house is all white so there is this little difference in the way but then since we have kind of uh, proximity because we've been working for a while so we don't have also this separation too much like this is like your field and this is the metaphor. It's kind of mixed together. Sometimes some of the ideas, uh, we are doing another one project that I didn't show about the Antarctica with the two oceanographer physicists. And sometimes also they, ha they give ideas about the artwork because they are very into one of them. He did the theater, the other the one does photography. Of course, I chose scientists work that are more open to art. And then the chemistry that I work, I like once a week I have lunch with her in the universe and we discuss about the projects we are doing. So I know the other projects she's doing and she knows the other projects that I'm doing. And then when we try to work together, I talk about this performance and what we could do. And then we start discussing about this Posedonia that I saw all the time. And then we start thinking, how could I use in the performance? So it's more, she like, oh, I want to see a little bit. He hurts so a bit for me, so I can understand how you're gonna do. So it's kind of, kind of blends in a way because I use more the science as a curiosity. I want to understand a little bit more what I don't understand, and then they kind of say, "Oh, she can visualize things that we cannot," and then she can tell to the public things that we cannot tell in a way, kind of science outreach or something like that in a way. So it's a little bit. Okay, I have to close. Uh, one more or no? No? Close, okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, it, it was really interesting to see these uh, this, uh, two perspectives uh, about this, the contact with nature and uh, arise uh, these, these questions arise. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm um, really I'm an artist too, and I'm trying to, to, to make an approach which is uh, related basically with something that has um, uh, a fundamental uh, contact, which is uh, form and function. Uh, mm, and. Uh, through uh, the experience of uh, trying to understand, because many scientists has, uh, are working with that on that perspective, but is not well known, and is really important. And uh, cognitive science, for example, is working on that perspective, and the the work uh, you are doing uh, well, uh, feeling the water and knowing what's the state of the water is the type of contact we need with the planet, I, as, I, as I understand, to, to try to open our minds on what's planet reality. Because that's the, the main question in the, in the, in the, um, in the um, possibilities the, the crisis is opening is that possibility to, because we have the technical uh, possibility, uh, capacity to explore and try to understand 
but uh, this approach between science and art maybe can be the, the, the most important part of uh, this, the questions that arise because we need to understand nature as, as a wholeness and we as part of this wholeness. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. I think we can just end the panel just thinking that with this, that we are part of nature. We are not separate. We are, we are part. So if we destroy nature, we destroy ourselves. It's just that. Okay, thank you very much for everybody. And we have to get ready.